Hey everyone, the name is Eric Thor, and in today's video I'm talking about whether there is a case for a rationally founded spirituality, why do some people choose to believe in God despite otherwise being fully rational, logical people, right? And I think many scientific people and individuals see this as some kind of flaw in many great thinkers, because in a sense, why did Carl Jung choose to believe in God? Why do so many intelligent people like Jordan Peterson claim religious and spiritual experiences, right? And in this video, I'm going to show you why it can be a completely rational thing to do and why a lot of people benefit from opening their mind to spiritual experiences, right? Even if you're very, very rational as a human being, right? Carl Jung, he described much of these thoughts on spirituality in his book Ion and in it you can understand his approach to spirituality and if you're a very rational person you can also find in this book strong arguments for why you should choose to open your mind and expand your consciousness to entertain the idea of spiritual experiences and while this is a completely human thing to do because it could be argued that spirituality is hardwired into our DNA. It is something that humans have been gifted with in the sense, in the process of our evolution. And it's not a defect as it could be understood. It is something that gives humans the capacity to do and achieve things that they otherwise could not hope to do, right? Because here, let's imagine that we have two worlds. We have on the one side the rational world, where everything can be predicted and explained through a deterministic chain of events, right? And secondly, we have the irrational world. Now, Carl Jung was aware of these two and recognized that both of these domains exist within the spectrum of the self, right? And here he said that the ego fell under the rational self. And to some extent, the ego seeks to systematize and rationalize all that happens to it. It seeks an explanation for what is happening or it chooses to ignore and pretend that it has not happened, right? So it, the ego only understands what it can explain through rational experiences and through evidence and through the five senses and through what it can know, right? And so, on the other hand, we have to consider what it means to be irrational, what it means to give precedence to spiritual thoughts and experiences, and why people choose to do so. Well, one core reason why is because rationality and the ego can only explain what already is. When the ego explains why things are the way they are, the courses of events that are put down are quite linear and quite predictable. To some extent, the ego can only deal with what it already knows. It cannot learn new information. It cannot understand other people's feelings. It cannot comprehend anything that has not already happened, that they, it has not already experienced, right? So without this spiritual capacity, without this irrational capacity, people would never be able to gather new information. They would never be able to understand new things. They would never be able to comprehend or empathize with other people because it could only ever claim to understand what it already has achieved and experienced right and this is why some people talk about fixed mindsets and growth mindsets right because to have a growth mindset it requires you to to some extent surrender to some extent that there is something greater than you that there is something unknown that you have not yet come to understand that there is something magical outside that is beyond your current reasoning logic and critical thinking faculties right so you have to to some extent let go of uh, explanations and excuses and other things that might come up because it's for the rational mind to serve as the defensive aspect of the psyche the goal of the ego is to defend the self from irrational beliefs from risks from dangers from threats and from going out and doing something stupid because if we completely surrender to the irrational we might as well just go and jump off a bridge or we might just uh, you know do whatever because there is no rational basis for anything there is no ego there is no self there is no differentiation right and Carl Jung was very clear on that you know a differentiation must be made between these two and the ego must remain conscious right so it's fully okay to maintain your general rational beliefs and to maintain your 
current existing awareness and to work from yourself and what you've already done and what you already come to understand. The ego serves an important role in the self. It's not something that we have to kill or get rid of or toss in a bin. It's a completely normal and healthy aspect of ha happy and well-developed individual, right? It's a part of a happy and healthy and well-developed individual. What has to happen is that the rational self has to experience and understand a logical basis for why it can be good to do irrational things, right? So the rational self, the ego, has to gain experiences that prove that it's safe and that it's comfortable and that it's possible to do silly, irrational things. Because this will help the ego develop, it will help the self fulfill and meet its own needs, and it will help the individual, a person, you, in order to make positive decisions, right? And beyond that, it helps deal with the unknown, because the unknown is this pressing entity that is constantly all around us, right? Because all around us there are things we don't know. There's so many question marks floating around me right now, you know, if you think about it like that. And so what we have to do is just recognize that Spiritual experiences can have a rational basis and can be a positive thing. And sometimes I have to accept that I don't know everything and that there is more for me to understand. And this is why many philosophers say, you know, that I only know one thing and that is that I don't know anything, you know, like it's embracing and recognizing the positive traits of modesty and letting go of control and surrendering to an experience because you know that by doing so you're going to get more control, more understanding, more awareness, right? And here there's one danger, and that is the danger of ego inflation, right? Which is, you know, when we learn things, when we conquer things, when we gain understanding of things, you know, we can develop a sense of an inflated ego, right? In a sense, not of narcissism exactly, but in a sense of just belief that you already know everything there is to know, belief that you know better than everyone else around you. The idea, the general assumption that nobody else has something to teach you or offer you and that you yourself can do everything yourself. And that's the danger of modern day individualism, right? Because here we all come to believe of ourselves as superhumans that stand above everyone else and that we know everything, that we are capable of everything, that we are of a remarkable higher intellect compared to other people, you know regardless if this is true or not, in a sense. And it breeds a level of alienation, which is like, why is everyone else so dysfunctional? Why is everyone else so broken? While I'm completely healthy and completely normal and just perfect the way I am, right? <laughs> and Jung also warned about this tendency. And it can happen, especially when people are extremely arrogant and extremely self-righteous about often very rational beliefs, right? So. Here we have like one common problem of the ego. There are many you could call sicknesses of the ego in a sense, like pride, like things that just make you feel blind, like things like depression, deep pressure. Like many depressed people tend to become stuck in this world of, well, the world outside is evil, everything that's gonna happen to me is bad, nothing good is ever gonna happen to me, and you know, everything I try fails and nothing ever works out in the sense of, you know, in here, like often the problem with these ideas is that they're often highly accurate. Yes, most things that you've done up until this point have failed. Yes, most things that you've tried have not worked out. Yes, many of the experiences that you've had in the past have been that bad in a sense. And so you have a rational basis for everything you believe. And in general, depressed people tend to have a very accurate way of looking at the world, right? And that's why it's so blinding, because it's so accurate, because it's so true in a sense that we're like hypnotizing ourselves by constantly repeating it to ourselves. And um, the worst part of it is that it seeks new experiences that validate its own assumptions, right? So what I also see with many depressed people is that they constantly keep engaging in and with people and with things that will prove that they are correct about this, that it will prove that, hey, see, I'm still getting bad experiences. Hey, look, these people are still evil. Hey, look, these people are still selfish, you know, like 
often there is this desire for the ego to prove its own beliefs by constantly repeating it over and over again, right? So here what you're doing is you're gathering evidence to maintain this rational world which you built up for yourself. And this is uh, the general script of the modern man, right? Because we all live in the script where there's like, not even if you're depressed, but just in general, if you're a person, what you tend to have is this idea of the world of the good guys and the bad guys, of uh, me and what I am and what everyone else is, right? And most people walk around with these general assumptions of what you are, what you are supposed to do, your specialization, your type, your personality, versus everyone else that's not like you. And often we tend to work with ourselves as the good guys, right? So we are the good guys, we are the smart ones, we are the capable ones, we are the, good, the great people, the good personalities, and they are the bad personalities, they are the shallow ones, they are the stupid ones, they are the incapable ones, right? And we go and we walk around with these general sets of assumptions. We judge other people by what they don't do, and we judge ourselves by what we do, and here, you know, you have the basis of somebody that's going to be confident and that is going to have a high level of assertiveness and that is going to feel relatively good about themselves. But you also have the recipe of a person that is generally deluded in the sense that they hold to blind spots and inaccurate assumptions and a worldview that is by its nature completely incomplete, right? Because uh, you're choosing to focus on things that verify whatever it is that you want to believe and you're choosing to project into other people whatever it is that you don't want to deal with in yourself, right? And most people can't even see that this is their script, but all their friends can hear it, you know, because when you talk with each other, all you can hear is, you know, here he goes talking about this again. Oh my, he's back to this problem and oh, he keeps repeating this story over and over. And here's what we have to do is we have to watch out for repetition in a sense of like, do I have some general assumptions about people or about myself that I keep telling everyone? Do I have something that I keep coming back to? Some general theme in life that I keep falling into? Do I have a cycle? Because most people have a cycle, you know, they move from this point where they're very confident to this point where they're more challenged to this point where they're starting to feel less confident to this point where everything falls apart to this point where they start over and try again and they keep walking in this cycle, right? And often we're stuck in the script because, you know, when it all falls apart, we're like, should I give up? And then we realize that we can't give up because we've invested too much into the script. So we keep trying, you know, over and over. And it's the gambler's fallacy going on here because we're also constantly repeating it. And I mentioned this because this is all a part of the ego and how the general structure of the ego is. The ego lives with a constant state of internal conflict because it has things it refuses to deal with and generalize and understand. And so, you know, the question is, what is the antidote? And here, what I found is the antidote is a general sense of spirituality. And how did I arrive at this spirituality? Why did I choose to believe that spirituality was often the answer to these problems? Well, first of all, through meditation, because what I found is that most people have free will, but don't choose to use it, right? So it means that it's there, it is a faculty that you have inside yourself, but often you're not capable of using it. Because what most people use to motivate and energize and drive their decision making is habitation and repetition and embodiment, right? Because you've embodied and you come to believe and look at yourself a certain way and you come to have a general set of values and predispositions and attitudes about things and this makes all your decisions quite linear and quite predictable and which is why it's so easy to read people out on the streets and to guess their personalities and to do a lot of things because you can tell what they're going to do because you can tell how they see themselves because people tend to conform to some relatively stereotypical sets of scripts and beliefs and identities that are generally very habitual in their nature. And when it's habitual, it's also linear, then it's also predictable. But free will is not predictable, right? Because free will is that capacity in yourself to choose a different path, to constantly be able to take another route, to go another way, to do something different than what you do normally, right? So how do you experience that? Well, one way to do it is by simply clearing your mind, taking a deep breath, 
and simply asking yourself questions in yes or no form. Am I happy? Yes or no? And then you listen for the answer. And what's the most surprising is an answer is always going to come. There's always going to be that person that says, yeah, or no. But meditation also teaches you something different. It teaches you to observe your own thoughts, right? And here, something changes because most people experience the world from this first person point of view where I am my thoughts. And if I think something, that can be a very uncomfortable because I don't want to think about that. And well, I want to think about this and I want to believe that and I want to have these assumptions and I want to do these things and I want to have those general thoughts, right? So you're kind of conditioning yourself to think a certain way and to not think another way, right? But these thoughts keep coming back and you know, it's what creates this sense of internal conflict inside the self, right? And here, one general question that you might have to ask yourself is just this, what if I can choose to be the train conductor of my mind, the person that chooses which thoughts to take which paths to go down? What if I could learn to condition my thoughts, to think about my thoughts, to reflect on my thoughts? What if I can say, just, no, I'm not going to have that thought. Or, hey, I'm just going to not think for a second, you know, to just clear my mind. And some people are so attached to this, like, generally, that, no, you're always thinking. It's not possible. This is, doesn't work. It's not for me. Meditation, it's very uncomfortable, right? And it can be, and I understand, and that's the case, well, don't do it if you're not comfortable doing it and if you don't want to do it it's completely fine and it's all up to you it's important that you recognize and honor your own experiences and listen to yourself but you might want to ask yourself why it's so uncomfortable why does it not feel nice and like what kind of things are causing problems in my life that's making it stressful to just sit down and be still right and a general question like you might ask yourself before you start doing this is why do it what's the point because Generally, we have the idea that we're always supposed to be productive, that we're always supposed to be rational, that we're always supposed to be, you know, following this general set of chains of events that's going to be completely logical and it's going to get us to the results that we want, you know, right? And it can be hard to understand why to do something that has no rational basis or goal, that doesn't lead anywhere, that doesn't produce any result, right? And so we can say, oh, well, actually, scientific studies have shown that meditation has been helpful, blah, 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 right? <laughs> but... It's kind of missing the point because once again, yes, there is a rational basis to be spiritual and to be and engage in spiritual experiences. There is a point to prayer, there is a point to meditation, there is a point to belief. It provides necessary possibilities for the mind to learn and to improve learning and retention and to improve personal growth, to increase well-being and happiness to create the space for more fulfilling relationships, for more happiness. And there is a basis for how spirituality can contribute to free will and long-term and realistic change in your life, right? It seems to be that spirituality is what we need in order to really break our scripts and to open our mind to something higher. And it's been shown that Experiences like love, which is a very spiritual experience, right? Give us powers that we didn't have before, right? So spirit, inside spirituality, there's like 50% of your cognitive capacity is spiritually grounded, irrationally grounded, right? 50% of yourself is, well, completely rational. But if you're only using the rational mind, you're only using 50% of your cognitive faculties and you're missing out on something that can aid you in making good decisions and in doing better things. And there's books like Blink which prove that it's capable, it's fully possible for people to make accurate predictions about things within milliseconds, right? Just Blink. In the matter of seconds, we can just intuitively guess a lot of things about the world. We don't have to rationally think about everything. We don't have to let everything follow through a logical chain. There is a genuine rational basis for creativity, chaos, messiness, spirituality. The most important thing is that the spirituality that we engage in is one that is and makes us healthier and happier, right? And I think many reasons why people are critical of spirituality is because sometimes it's used to manipulate people, sometimes it's used to disarm people, sometimes it's used to sell things that are malicious or harmful to people. But 
there's also certainly many examples of how spirituality can be used to help people experience enlightenment, self-transcendence, personal growth. It's certainly been shown that it can help people deal with things like depression, alcoholism, and a lot of problems in life. The most important part is that we listen to ourselves and we think about, you know, what is good for me, what makes me happy, and what is something that will push me forward in a positive direction, right? At least that's what I think. What do you think? Feel free to let me know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching. See you all in the next video.